choir. What a great way to start the Advent season. Does it feel different already in this space, the Advent vibe? And it's a different kind of vibe than a lot of what we see outside. Advent is a sacred season that our church is a part of. Not every Christian church celebrates Advent. So I always uh, want to lift it up, point out, and it is distinctive from Christmas. But don't worry, you will get to sing Christmas carols too. But in Advent, it's kind of a season of hushed, of humility, of waiting, of being in the dark, and trusting. It's a great time to be reading Isaiah. Isaiah is a classic uh, kind of reading. The prophets are often read during the Advent season. So welcome aboard as we study, continue to study Isaiah together. And this particular section of Isaiah that we're reading right now, <clears throat> I think I'm a little allergic to the burlap, but I think I'll be okay. <laughs> Um, this particular part of Isaiah that we're reading, we're in chapters 40 through 66 right now. Lovely part of Isaiah. I know some of the readings that we do, we're very big on Bible study here. Some of the parts of the Bible are hard to understand and you kind of have to slog through it. But I commend chapters 40 to 66 to you. And get out a pencil and underline some things because this part of Isaiah is very soulful. It has comfort. It has love. And it also has justice and ethics in it. So this particular, we're spending about four weeks in this part of Isaiah, and I was tickled to hear at Friday Bible study someone say, you know, I think I'm going to miss Isaiah a little bit. So just, we just have a couple more weeks left, and then we're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew. But yeah, we're nearing the end of Isaiah, but still soak it up. This particular week, we were reading Isaiah chapters 56 through 60. And 56 is kind of fun. You can read it and enjoy it. Chapter 60 is really beautiful. It talks about light. And for today... We are anchored in chapter 50. And one particular verse in chapter 50, it's verse 12, says, You shall be called repairers of the breach. You shall be called repairers of the breach. What does that mean? Well, um, one thing to think about with that verse is it's actually on the wall of our covenant room. It's on a poster that is promoting our yearly one great hour of sharing offering. So that's the offering we take at Lent and Easter. So they anchor that whole idea of offering in Isaiah 58. You shall be called repairer of the breach. But maybe still that sounds like a foreign concept. What, what does that mean to be a repairer of the breach? Well, I was looking at a different translation from the Pew Bibles, the CEB translation, and this was lifted up by uh, Phyllis in our Friday study. The CEB translation literally says, it, where it says, you shall be called, and then it says, mender of broken places or mender of walls, a mender. And it was capitalized like your name, just like Sarah. Instead of Sarah, I'm going to be called men, mender of broken places. Mender of broken places. Kind of reminded me of indigenous names or maybe fake indigenous names, you know, like dances with wolves or something like that. But this part of the Bible has this sort of spiritual vision of what our true name could be, mender of broken places. But before we get that name in the vision, Isaiah has a different name for people, and it's kind of like 
pigs. There's a name that the reading begins with regarding people who think they're practicing religion and they are not. They are practicing false religion. That's their name. Practicer of false religion is the first part of the story before we ever get to that mender of broken places. Isaiah 58, as we graphically experienced this morning, features people who think they're so religious. And one expression of their religion is fasting. And um, it seems that the fasting they were doing was a way that was showing off. Like, look at me, do this religious practice. All right, God, bring me good things. It's all about me. Look at me, do this religious thing. And then they have a little bit of smugness about what their religion is all about. Their religion, turns out, it's all about them. Religion is self-serving and not God-serving. So Isaiah 58 is an expose of false worship. <clears throat> Isaiah conjuring God. God is speaking. He, God is saying, you people... You're doing all these things and acting like you're so religious, but it's all about you. True religion, Isaiah 58 says, is about justice for the oppressed. It's about looking out for your workers. It's about feeding the hungry. It's about housing those who need homes. It's about feeding, um, ba meeting basic needs food, clothing, and shelter. That's religion. And if it sounds a little bit familiar to us, it reminds me at least of Matthew chapter 25, where it says, Lord, when did we see you without a house or when you were a stranger or when, when were you hungry? And um, in, the, in the moments where we see anybody in that condition, Matthew 25 says, we are encountering Christ. So there's vibes of that here. In, oh, there's our train, in, um, in chapter 58. So it's an expose, it's a statement, you act like you're all religious, how, how nice for you, how very smug, but true religion is fighting injustice and looking out for the oppressed. So this week I was following a story and it fascinated me, so I, I looked it up in several different places to learn more about it. Um, apparently, there was a delegation of Christian leaders who came to Washington, D.C. Doesn't that sound like the startup of a joke? Like, Christian leaders walked into a bar. No, Christian leaders from Bethlehem, you know Bethlehem, uh, came to Washington, D.C. So, Bethlehem. So Bethlehem may be familiar to us on a few different levels. If you were part of our first and second Samuel study, you'll remember King David was born in Bethlehem. And we might even have, yeah, we still have the label in here. Do you remember that? If you were in the study, we had this label on here all summer long and part of the fall. So uh, King David was a shepherd boy who grew up in Bethlehem. So that's one thing about Bethlehem. Another thing about Bethlehem, hmm, spoiler alert, who else was born in Bethlehem? Jesus. And you may know a song. You guys are awfully quiet, so I think we need to sing. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light above the deep. The silent stars go by. We'll leave it there. In thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So Bethlehem. Bethlehem um, actually is an occupied city. 
these days. Um, it is part of the West Bank. It is Palestinian. It's, it's supposed to be for where Palestinian people live, but it is Israeli occupied. So Bethlehem is a place of strife, actually, in recent years. So it has a totally different connotation. So these Christian leaders from old little town of Bethlehem came to Washington, D.C., and they said, you know what? We are not celebrating Christmas this year. It's a pretty strong statement. Christian leaders from Bethlehem saying, we are not going to celebrate Christmas this year. I mean, their town revolves around the nativity industry, right? Whoa. They're like, no. It just feels sickening and not authentic to us when our neighbors in Gaza are getting pummeled by the excesses of war. We are sickened by what is going on around us. And so they bore witness to that. Wow. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. And they have other statements, and they've been looking at the situation for decades. And so is the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, situation on the ground, looking at what is justice, what is peace, what is fair, what is true religion. True religion. Kind of like Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58 is an expose. If you're going to church to feel good about yourself, if you're coming to church to make it all about you, you're missing the point. Church and religion are about serving others, opening our eyes, awakening ourselves to who is really oppressed in our midst and serving them. It's a really big deal. It's the centrality. It's our belief. And so this Advent season, every Advent's different at our church. And this Advent, you know, upon reflection, as I was looking at the text and listening to these Palestinian Christians, I thought, man, I'm glad we're going with the burlap vibe this year. It makes me feel like we're standing in solidarity with all the oppressed this season. It's a really, really hard season. We took the flying pigs down, not because we still don't, we don't believe in miracles, but we are thinking about there's times where we feel like we can't fly. We feel a little oppressed and sad. So our pigs are kind of standing and sitting and hiding this season in solidarity with people who suffer. Isaiah 58 says, when we pivot and look out for those who suffer, that is where we find God, where we experience Emmanuel. We experience light and healing. It's a total spiritual mystery. You know, I like lights and color and the Hallmark Channel like anybody, right? But here this season in church, we're going to mute our senses just a little bit. We're going to go burlap. We're going to have some darkness. We're going to have some humility, some low-key times. We start with just the lighting of one little candle. And maybe in the darkness... Our spiritual senses come to light, and we see the things of God. I invite you into this season of Advent, and maybe you will find your spiritual name. Your name that God and you and your developing soul um, realizes. You know, what is your call? What is your purpose? What is your sacrifice? What is your true sacrifice? What is your true religion? You know, how you practice religion shows a piece of your authentic selves. I hope you find your spirit name this Advent. 
a place where you are in solidarity with those who suffer. It's a community where we have a little bit of light, we have a humble major, and it is enough to guide us. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.